I would like to explain the evolutionary process of business model innovation as Clayton Christensen lays it out. And um, he goes through these three stages that are sort of evolutionary from the bottom moving up on this diagram. So starting with solution shops, moving to value-added process businesses, and then to facilitated network businesses. So I want to explain how that works. And I'm getting this from The Innovator's Prescription, which is a book that I've assigned in my healthcare economics classes for many, many years. And I think this is really helpful in thinking about how businesses evolve over time, how industries evolve over time, and patterns we tend to see as businesses improve upon themselves and disrupt other businesses. So first let me just explain the difference between these three types of businesses and then I'll explain why, um, why there's a natural movement from one to the other to the other. So starting at the bottom layer, we have solution shops, and this is businesses that mainly rely on giving people expertise, where that expertise involves intuition, it might involve um, interpretation of data by experts, it might involve somebody who's going to help you solve a problem through their own ingenuity. And the classic example of a solution shop is a consulting firm, because of course consulting firms do exactly this. Um, a business comes to them with a problem and the consultants will do research, they'll come up with creative solutions and present those solutions to that business. But solution shops can also include doctors who listen to the patient's problem and use their own well-trained expertise and medical intuition to diagnose the patient, recommend treatments. Um, so that's a basic solution shop. Now a value-added process business is basically an assembly line. It's where you go to the business once again to solve one of your problems. But the business has streamlined that solution to that problem so much that it no longer requires expertise. It's just sort of, we know what the process is, we're going to do that process as efficiently as possible. So the value they're offering really is more efficiency rather than expertise. Um, and they do that, of course, by taking the expertise from the past and just making that play out more efficiently. So you should really think assembly line when you think about a value-added process business. And then the most recent innovation is facilitated networks. And this is businesses where instead of being an assembly line, they're really creating the platform that connects two sides of a market. That's buyers and sellers. It can be connecting people in a dating market. It can be connecting doctors and patients. Um, the business is basically sort of the mini government that creates the space with contracts and rules and enforcement that makes um, the relationship between the buyers and sellers or whatever parties happen to be going to the platform that makes that interaction a positive one that helps that interaction go really smoothly. And I think the more modern um, way of referring to facilitated networks is that these are platforms. In fact, the book The Platform Revolution is really about what are the unique properties of platforms in the modern economy. So if you want to learn more about facilitated networks, I recommend The Platform Revolution. Okay, so why does business model innovation tend to happen in this upward direction? where businesses start out as, as solution shops, then they move to value-added process businesses, and in the most recent iteration, they move to facilitated network businesses. Well, one, one reason is because um, throughout history, people come to each other to purchase solutions to their problems, and when you first come up with a solution that's better than what the person could come up with themselves, it's going to involve some expertise. And we might imagine a shoemaker, like somewhere in the history of human beings, um, people got tired of walking barefoot, or they got tired of perhaps making their own shoes within their tribes. Maybe their shoes were kind of uncomfortable, they got blisters on their feet. So someone came up with a the idea of selling shoes to other people, and to do that, they needed to have people who really thought carefully about what makes a shoe comfortable, they used their intuition in building shoes, they gained expertise in building shoes that was sort of 
through experience, through um, through learning from their father. The expertise of the shoemaker throughout history was in a lot of ways in the realm of a solution shop that involved um, intuitive expertise from someone who understood that industry. Now, of course, once people recognized, actually, we figured out how to make a pretty good shoe with this person's intuition, then someone else can come along and say, actually, so many people buy that one shoe, I could, I could actually take that expertise and not add any intuition or knowledge of my own, but simply make that really cheap by developing an assembly line to produce the shoe for a lower cost. And that way I can sell it to the masses and make a lot of money as someone not who's adding the expertise, but who's making things cheap. And so that's the next stage in this business process. And then, of course, facilitated networks are basically saying, actually, there's lots of different value-added process businesses. Some of these are small businesses. Some of these could be done in a single household. Some require biz big businesses. But if we want to match the shoe with the buyer in a way that really gets at that particular buyer's needs, we could set up a platform like, like Amazon that's going to match the particular customer with the value-added process business that best serves their needs. So this is the next layer of disruption that sort of creates a new industry that's even more efficient than the other two. And we can really think about facilitated networks as sort of marrying the expertise, which might involve personalization, with the efficiency of the value-added process business. Because what tends to happen is that you're only going to get an assembly line value-added process sort of business if there's enough um, demand for that product. So they, they, these businesses tend to look at what are the highest volume sales from the solution shops, and let's make those really cheap. That means um, if, you're, if you're only um, buying from facilitated uh, from value-added process businesses, you can really only afford the mass-produced product and therefore the personalized products that goes along with a solution shop version, um, those are inaccessible to you. But the platforms actually make it, the, the platforms actually open the door to regular consumers being able to buy from both the solution shops, which might be out of someone's home, or the, the value-added process businesses. So it opens up a broader range of quality while still capturing the, the cheapness of the value-added process business. So that's just an overview of these three types of business models and how business model innovation tends to move us through one to another to another.